Hello everybody, welcome to Sakshi TV and welcome to the show, Ask Your Doctor. I'm your host, Sanjana Chekuri, and today I have here with me a very special guest, Dr. Manchir Singh. Thank you so much, thanks for having me. Dr. Manchir Singh is a Harvard, Yale and Johns Hopkins trained surgeon, and he is the medical director of the Facial Plastic Group of Surgery in New York City, located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Dr. Singh completed his medical education at the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences and went on to complete his residency in general surgery at Harvard Medical School, followed by another three years to specialize in plastic and reconstructive surgery at Johns Hopkins Medical School, which has been ranked the number one hospital in the US for 21 consecutive years. How impressive is that? Dr. Singh has mastered his skills in complex plastic surgery by training under visionaries and leaders of plastic surgery. Additionally, Dr. Singh has also served as a chief resident of the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Department at Johns Hopkins, where he's now also an assistant professor. He is just a wonderful human being, and he has also, that's not the very least, he has also received two awards as a real self-top doctor and the second most reviews for any doctor in the country from 2022. We are able to see his testament to his work and dedication towards all of his patients with his 240 plus five-star reviews on Google, along with his 215 plus five-star reviews on Real Self. So thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Singh, and we look forward to hearing everything that you have to say, as I'm sure that everyone here is just as excited to hear more. Thank you so much. So first of all, uh, thank you Sakshi TV for uh, having me. Uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity and we look forward to this whole talk show. So Dr. Singh, without further ado, could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your journey to becoming a plastic surgeon? Yes, of course. So I come from a family of doctors. Uh, my granddad, who was a lawyer, used to joke that he wanted a soccer team full of doctors and uh, I happened to be the 11th in my extended family to go to medical school. So there was uh, lots of celebration when I entered medical school now we have people in the reserve because my cousins went to medical school as well. Uh, after completing medical school, my both parents are doctors, they're in surgical field, so I always wanted to be a surgeon. I think that came instinctively to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got introduced to plastic surgery while I was doing my general surgery training. And uh, I was just blown away by the field. So after completing my general surgery training at Harvard, I went to uh, Baltimore at Johns Hopkins where I did plastic surgery training. And there I really enjoyed the aesthetic part of the plastic surgery and uh, I honed my skills more in the aesthetic plastic surgery aspect. And we moved to uh, New York uh, in July of 21 and then I've been here for a couple of years now. Wow, so indeed a whole football family of like a football team of like doctors in your family. Yes. That's wonderful. Uh, so going into your practice, I would like to know a little bit about if you have a specific age range for your patients or is it specifically for older patients and could you provide me an approximate age range for the different patients that you have? Yes, of course. So as we, as we discussed, uh, we focus exclusively uh, on aesthetic surgery, but that also can range from head to toe. There are lots of patients who are mothers who had kids and now they have abdominal deformity. So they need uh, abdominoplasty or liposuction. So we do lots of breast surgery, we do lots of body surgeries, but my niche or my passion really lies in face and uh, facial rejuvenation. Uh, with regards to age uh, group, uh, it's really divided across different age groups. So as, when you're in 20s or 30s, you need a specific, I see patients with very specific needs as opposed to patients who are in their 60s. Right. Uh, they come for very specific uh, procedures uh, such as facelift uh, in aging face. Patients who are in their 20s or 30s might be worried, concerned with a double chin appearance or their lower face is full, they might want a buccal fat reduction or their lower eyelid, they have congenital fat, fat backs that they want to get rid of. So it's, it's a bit of a fallacy that plastic surgery is only for aging and elderly patients. I do think it's the right patient for if that's what you want or if that's what bothers you. There's no specific age limit or age pattern. We see patients from all age groups. Right. And I think going off of that, the, uh, we can see that you're in such a gratifying line of work to be able to make an impact on patients from all age ranges, especially if they're going into plastic surgery, you play an important role in building up their confidence levels. Uh, and when we're coming to that, it is equally as important as a physician to be establishing that kind of relationship and trust in your patients. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, before we even get into the surgical aspect, what are some steps that you take in order to ensure that confidence is instilled within your patients? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I feel there are a few things. So plastic surgery, it's an elective procedure. I always tell my patients they should only get this procedure because they want to do it. They should not have any secondary goals or secondary gains. They should never do it if their boyfriend wants to do it, their husband wants to do it. They should not do it because to advance their career because you should do it, you should internalize it. So what I tell my patient, there are two things you need to commit. You need to commit to the surgery, you need to commit to the surgeon. Once you are sure like he or she is the right person and this is the right procedure, everything else, we can work around it. So my practice is a bit unique in the sense that it's very patient centric. When the patient makes a phone call for an inquiry, I always try my best to be the first person there here, not anyone from my team, but me. And most of the patients are very pleasantly surprised, which to me, it's a very natural thing to do. If a patient is seeking, they're coming to, they're planning a surgery, their surgeon should be the first person greeting them. Mm -hmm. And I do think that has an impact on the patient. But I think mo the other aspect that's just as important is like you should be proud of your results you deliver, yes. the patient should be happy. But I do think the aftercare that you provide to the patients is just as important. So every patient I operate on, they get a phone call from my personal cell phone, uh, my personal line, the, the night of surgery. Every Sunday, they get a phone call for next three Sundays. So by time the patient is almost a month out, we are on very friendly terms. They feel very comfortable approaching me. And uh, lots of my colleagues have warned me about it, about sharing your personal number. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, I feel patients are extremely respectful of you. If anything, they, they are very specific about the questions they ask or they don't ask. And till this day, I've not had a single patient abuse it or call me incessantly for, for very trivial things. I think pretty much all of the concerns that they come up with are very reasonable. So I think it takes a a little bit of a time and effort, but by the time the patient comes walk through our door, the surgery is done and they're recovered, we become not just patients and doctor, but we become really good friends. That makes a lot of sense and I can definitely attest to that on my end where uh, having that kind of relationship with your physician just makes your life a lot easier and a lot of people suffer from like anxiety about visiting their doctors, but I think you're doing a great uh, effort in order to ensure that they do feel their best before they come to you. Thank you. appreciate that. Yeah. And with that, I would I'd like to segue into if you could just give me a general overview of the different types of procedures. Once again, you said that uh, there's different types depending on the age range, whether they're younger, older patients. So can you just give me an overview of the types of procedures you do from head to toe? I'm a fully trained plastic surgeon. Uh, I specialize in aesthetic or cosmetic surgery. So we do a whole our, our niche practice is facial rejuvenation and we will talk about that uh, very imminently but we also do breast and breast augmentation breast lift mommy makeover abdominoplasty liposuction pretty much any plastic surgery procedure for your breast and body and your face that uh, that you'd seek uh, we do it because uh, it's a very exclusive field it might sound like too much but the way I explain it to my patients, my general surgery training was seven years. My plastic surgery was three years. Medical school was another five, six years. So between 16, 17 years of training, it comes down to about five or six procedures that I do. So if it break down for every two or three years of education, right. it's one procedure that I do. And uh, I learn a lot, like lots of principles that I do for tummy tuck or abdominoplasty, mm -hmm. how I'm closing, I'm distributing the tension. I borrow that from when I'm doing facelift and vice versa. So mm -hmm. there is lots of uh, overlap, even at a sub subconscious level. And I do think being able to utilize that to your advantage gives me uh, get some added benefit or skill. You have to break it down to a niche or passion or what I really enjoy doing. It has to be facial rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. You actually uh, directly answered my next question. I wanted to see if you could also talk a little bit about why facial rejuvenation is your favorite procedure. Okay, yeah, I think that's... that's. So there's something about facelift or facial rejuvenation that has always appealed to me. Mm -hmm. I do believe face is the epicenter of your body. And I have had many patients come to me when they get their body procedure done and they're planning on their facelift. Mm -hmm and they always get their body procedure done first. And they're like, let me see, let me do a test drive with my body, see how it heals. Because 
this is my face. So I do feel there's a very different level of uh, expectations when it comes to face. If you have a small scar from your tummy tuck, you can put a clothes on, you can hide it. Right. If you have a scar, a visible scar on your face, that is your face. Right. You cannot hide it. So I do think there is a very different level of finesse that's needed for a face procedure. And besides, I also feel it's very elegant, very powerful. I'm very close to my mom and lots of these patients are elderly and uh, I'm able to relate to them very well. And then when I see their before and after, when I see, when I become a part of their journey, and it's just extremely gratifying for me to be able to see that and uh, the patients develop a trust right. relationship with me. Mm -hmm. And I love that you said you, you're relating your patients back to your mom because I think that also reflects in the way you reach out to them and you show your care because your patients essentially become like your family, right? You want to give them the most amount of care and like love and respect when they are going into these type of procedures because that's the kind of trust they need in their physicians. Yes, that's very true because mm -hmm. I feel uh, Patients almost become more than family mm -hmm. just based on how much time I end up spending with them. Right. And if I am going under anesthesia, I'm completely out. I want to be with a surgeon, I trust a surgeon with whom I have some kind of rapport. Mm -hmm. It does not matter if you're the best surgeon in the world. If I am not comfortable with you, I don't think I'd be getting my surgery with you or from you. So I always keep that in mind. I try to put myself on the other side of the table, mm -hmm. no pun intended. I just try to comfort the patient, make them relax. It's going to be okay. And uh, I do think that definitely translates into their outcome, their overall confidence level. Uh, so I think that's a very important aspect of patient care. Very true. So with that, I do want to segue into talking a little bit about what is the most common procedure that you work on? And uh, what is unique or specific to your techniques as compared to the way other surgeons would be operating? Sure. So uh, facial rejuvenation is something that I, I really especially enjoy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the foundation or the most important aspect of, uh, of facial rejuvenation in, in regards to an aging face is a facelift surgery. Yes. So that's something that's my favorite procedure if I have to pick and uh, it's not a secret if you go on my website my Instagram if you talk to my colleagues from five years ago everyone knows this is procedure I like the most this is one I love and uh, I have worked very hard to finesse my skills uh, so yeah that's one procedure if I had to pick uh, I'd go with okay and uh, going straight into uh, a weak facelift I think what separates you from my research is that you specialize in awake, deep, plain facelift. So if you could talk a little bit about how that procedure works and just what's, again, unique about that and the way that you operate. Yes, 100%. So I'm, this is just my personal experience. I've worked with lots of other plastic surgeons. Mm -hmm. They're very talented, great bunch of people. I'm very fortunate to call them friends. So by no means I'm trying to implicate whatever I'm saying this is the only way to do. This is my experience in my hands with my patients. So everything I'm about to say, it, you have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. So there are very few people, very few plastic surgeons who do awake facelift. Yes. Now, people freak out when they hear awake facelift because it's almost an oxymoron. How can you be awake when you're getting something as gruesome as a facelift? Mm -hmm. So it's actually works to my advantage because when patients are awake and I'm doing the neck part or the neck lift part, I ask them to extend their neck. I can go really low. When I'm on their side, I tell them to turn their neck sideways. So when a patient is completely asleep, we really have to reposition them. We have to change their angle because the patient is not cooperating. It's more intuitive for me with regards to the patient. So it's awake, but they get oral sedation, meaning they get what we call our specialized, specialized cocktail. It's a sedative, it's a pain medication, and they're listening to their favorite music. Mm -hmm. They are in a very happy place. We always tell them what happens in the OR stays in OR. <laughs> Even if they're blurting out their life secrets, it stays there, it's a safe place. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point is they are very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we are concerning or we are affecting the safety or patient comfort by any level. Right. Even when we're doing this procedure awake, we're doing it in a fully agreed operating room. The patient has monitors on, they're being monitored very closely. So everything else is the same except the patient is not completely asleep. As a surgeon, I do 90% of my facelifts awake, oh, wow. only 10% 
Those are patients who have very high, they just say, if I go to dentist office, I need five times the amount of pain medication or their baseline anxiety level is very high. I tell them you might be better off uh, going to sleep. Uh, but besides that, I do mostly awake. And in my experience, because they're not overloaded with all the general, all the anesthetic medication yes. that they would get otherwise, uh, their recovery is much faster, the swelling is less, the post-op nausea, vomiting, uh, recovery overall is so much better. Right. I think that's such an important point that as much as like uh, the surgery is like a very important thing that patients focus on, not having to use anesthesia definitely makes their recovery a lot faster. Correct. So that is a very useful point. And also I know that a lot of patients have myths surrounding uh, anesthesia. So like what is some of those myths that you'd like to debunk today and yes. talk about like how your technique is possibly better to like, you know, not have that fear instilled in the patients. Absolutely. So I think uh, that's a very good point. And this transcends plastic surgery, this transcends, this is applicable for any surgery. Mm -hmm. So many patients reach out to me, hey doc, I'm very excited about getting surgery from you because you do quote unquote awake facelift. And then I try to dwell into it a little bit. So what's your worry or concern with anesthesia? And then they're like, oh doc, what if I don't wake up? And mm -hmm. to this, I, I chuckle a little bit and I tell them I have not operated, but I've been around in the hospital. So I know of at least 40 to 50,000 surgeries that I know of mm -hmm. that was done under general anesthesia. And I asked them, guess how many patients did not wake up after the surgery? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely zero. In this day and age, with the advanced techniques that we have, the risks of general anesthesia, it's the risk of death or, or anything catastrophic yes. is very, very minimal. And I dare to say it's zero for all practical purposes mm -hmm. or tending zero. But the, the bigger concern is your recovery. You know, if, if you have anesthesia, then you're more groggy, especially if you had a tube in your mouth, you're going to be sore. Your recovery is just overall a little bit more painful. There's you're recovering from the surgery, but you're also recovering from general anesthesia and tons of medication that you get along with it on board. So your recovery is a bit more rough and uh, they already underwent a major procedure. Yes. And I feel if I could do anything to kind of make their recovery smoother, it would be, it would be worth the while. And I do think that's where the difference comes between doing it without uh, IV anesthesia versus using IV anesthesia. Right. And uh, the other point that I want to I wanna point out is even when my patients go to sleep for facelift, they never get a tube in their mouth or mm -hmm. almost never get a tube in their mouth. They get what's called an IV sedation. It's very similar to when you get a colonoscopy, for example. Mm -hmm. So you have an IV line, you get medication through your IV line mm -hmm. and you are more sleep than you are when, when I do oral medication. Yeah. So my patients almost never get general anesthesia, meaning a tube in their mouth, because mm -hmm. I think that's a totally different level of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So it's oral, either oral sedation or IV sedation. But most of the patients get oral sedation, meaning they're awake yet comfortable. And I do think that's probably the way to go with regards to your recovery. And my outcome has not been compromised by any means with that. Right. That makes sense. And I think adding on to how you're saying there's a speedy um, post-op recovery, I did read that I believe your patients get to leave like very soon after the procedure. They're like up on their toes and ready to go. Yeah, funny you mentioned because I had a patient come in from Florida uh -huh. and uh, she's a sweetheart. She's a realtor. And then uh, she wanted to document her journey. So wow. we had a uh, she's on our YouTube channel. So we literally had a video recording of her dancing while coming out from the OR, <laughs> giving thumbs up. And that's not unusual. It's not a unique experience. Most of the patients have very similar experience. They literally walk out of the OR. Their time during the recovery is half an hour and then they're good to go. Mm -hmm. So I think that definitely adds a very unique uh, aspect to our practice. Right. That sounds like the patient's dream, right? All the magic is done when you go into the doctor's office and you get to run right out. Exactly. <laughs> so with that, I would also like to ask you, uh, for your procedures, like, do you do standalone procedures or can you combine them with multiple to just get stuff done like a little faster, right? I'd like to point out the technique first. Yes. So, but with the facelift, it can either be done alone. Mm -hmm. It can very easily be combined because your facelift is the foundation. Correct. But there's your upper eyelid, your lower eyelid, and there are a bunch of other procedures that you can do. So it's very common for us to combine these procedures mm -hmm. uh, depending on the patient's requirement, what they, what they prefer. Uh, 
or we can just do the facelift alone or sometimes we just do those standalone procedures alone as well. I got you, I hear you. Uh, and then I think I'd also like to see if you could talk to the audience a little bit about the different procedures. I know we did cover them briefly, but like specifically starting from the face, starting from like blepharoplasty, could you just walk through like just what are the common ones that people talk about and usually like to get done? Yeah, so for uh, with facelift, you can combine a bunch of procedures as, mm -hmm. as we mentioned. So starting from top to bottom, mm -hmm. uh, you can do your upper eyelids. As you age, your upper eyelids tend to get saggy, bit bit of a ho hooding you get. So you get an upper blepharoplasty, the incision hides nicely in your, in your uh, crease. So it's almost like you didn't have a surgery, but the tired appearance. It's very interesting how much of a difference this subtle procedure can do. Mm -hmm. And then along with that comes lower blepharoplasty. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very common either as you age or even I've seen it in younger patients, congenital, like they have it, they had it for a oh, very wow. long time, mm -hmm. fat bags under their lower eyelids. Mm -hmm. So I make an incision from inside, get those fat bags out and tighten the skin if needed. Mm -hmm. So that's a upper, that's a lower blepharoplasty. So upper and lower blepharoplasty. Mm -hmm. As you age, your face gets hollow as well. Yeah. So facial fat transfer helps with that. And uh, that's something that you can do separately or you can combine that with facelift. Some patients have more fuller lower face mm -hmm. right here. You can do buccal fat reduction and especially in younger patients, uh, they're worried more about double chin appearance or their jawline not being crisp or they want more definition. Chin and neck liposculpting is a very good procedure that we do for them. Mm -hmm. There are a few other procedures, temporal brow lift, lip lift, the list is endless. People think it's just face, but the amount of procedures, the number of procedures that you can do, it's uh, each topic we can have a whole separate episode yeah, definitely. to discuss that. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very fascinating to hear about how the incision is made inside. So that means that there's no scarring on the outside that you have to worry about either, right? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I show it to the patient, they freak out initially, but <laughs> then they really love it because they are not having any visible scar from right. outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did talk a little bit about how like, I think there's the triangle of like the way your face eventually sags as you get older. So can you talk about like, what is like the aesthetic reasoning behind like how it happens and like how you approach your technique? Yes. So uh, I think there are two aspects to it. So it, it'll probably make more sense if we talk about the how facial aging happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we briefly talk about the techniques of facelift. And mm -hmm. I think this might be an opportune time to just kind of dwell into that a little bit yes. too. Mm -hmm. So a youthful face, uh, this golden ratio 1.68 or 1.67, I, I might be a little bit off on that, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, so if you divide your upper by lower face, it should be 1.68 of your lower face. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you need to have a, an aesthetic or youthful face is more top heavy. You have more volume up and it tapers down as you go lower. With aging, with gravity, everything descends. So your face changes from, from an inverted triangle, inverted mm -hmm. cone into more of a rectangle shape. So you have what's called jowling. You're in this part of the face descends and then you get jowling. Your neck starts sagging mm -hmm. and your mid face goes down. There are fat pads. There are a few fat pads in your cheekbone. Some of that goes away with age and some of that descends down. So overall, as you age, you get sagging face with a rectangular appearance, mm -hmm. jowling, these are platysmal bands, sagging neck and hollow mid face. Like I said, it's like foundation of the building. If everything is dropping down, the only way to fix it is to kind of pick it right back up. Right. And uh, the techniques, uh, their facelift, if you talk to 10 different surgeons, there are 10 different ways to do facelift. There is no scientific way to prove one is better than other, mm -hmm. but I'm again, just sharing my personal experience. Mm -hmm. The first part of the facelift is the, is the incision. The incision goes in your hairline, then around your ear, goes behind your ear. Once it's healed, it's perfect. I have on my Instagram, I have uh, photos of patients two months out and you really can, like I've zoomed it out so much and even I'm having a hard time trying to look at the incision. Oh, wow. So once that heals, that heals. But the crux of the surgery, it's not how you raise your skin, what you do underneath. Mm -hmm. So the muscle layer, which is called smas in your face and platysma in your neck, that's what kind of defines your facelift in my opinion. Yes. There are many different ways to do it. The simplest way to do it, you don't cut anything, you don't release anything, you literally bunch it up. It's called plication. So you're literally plicating that muscle layer mm -hmm. in your face, in your neck. 
Now the second procedure they can do or the second way to do it, you cut a little bit of that. So you create a defect in your muscle layer and then you kind of just pull it back. That gives a decent result as well. And those are the techniques that most of us do, including myself, that's what I was doing. Now I've switched to this technique called deep plane technique. It's not a new technique. It's been around for 30, 40 years, but I do think it's, it's gotten lots of traction over the last 10 years. So with deep plane technique, what I do is you go under that muscle layer, you release all that, those tethering ligaments. So try thinking of pulling something back to where it belonged 10, 15, 20 years ago, when it's in fact tethered or held by lots of ligaments or lots of structures that's holding it. Mm -hmm. If you just bunch it up, if you cut a small part of it, pull it back, you get some result. But I do think the most anatomic way to do it is to release everything that's holding it up, then it's completely freed and then you can vector it, you can bring it mm -hmm. in the exact same direction, the angle, how it was 20 years ago. So to me, deep plane is the pure science, pure way to do it. And uh, what I say, the way I like to preface it, there are very few surgeons who do awake facelift. There are very few surgeons who do deep plane facelift. And there are probably, you could count your fingers, number of surgeons who do awake deep plane facelift. So there are patients who chuckle, some of my colleagues who chuckle when I say I do awake facelift, because it's gotten a bit of a bad rep in the sense that people who do awake facelift, they're like, oh, you must be doing something very small, very trivial, because there's only so much you can do. And what I say with the deep plane technique that we do, it's probably more than what 95 to 99% of the time someone would do with the facelift right. and accept that they're awake. So it's like you're combining the best of both worlds, which is why in my experience, I've seen a very definite change in my results and the longevity of the results. I think the results are more natural and they last longer. So that's something I feel is it's a bit of a signature procedure for me, like doing it awake and using deep plane approach for facelift. So beautiful to hear. And I think uh, that's something that can be taken outside of just your medical practice. I think no matter where you are in life, it's important for each of us to adapt that mentality that we see in such an established individual who's able to be so humble. With that, I would like to ask if there's anything you would like to share with the Sakshi TV audience. Oh, yes, of course. So. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for watching us and showing us the love. Uh, again, there you can go wrong. This is New York City uh, or even in the US. There are so many talented colleagues. And if you choose me as a plastic surgeon and a patient, it's a privilege. It's something that I take very seriously. And I can just thank you, can't thank you enough for that. So. Uh, with that in mind, uh, thank you for watching us and uh, thank you for listening to us. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can always uh, reach out to me directly. You can follow me on my Instagram. It's Dr. Manshare Singh. So D R M A N S H E R S I N G H. Uh, our phone line is 332 261 9445. I try to personally answer that phone as much as I can. So please don't be surprised if you call and you hear from me directly and the voice sounds familiar. Our office is in Upper East Side. It's right across Central Park, uh, 72nd and 5th. And uh, we'd love to hear back from you. If you wanna just come say hello, if you wanna call us, say hello, or if you have any questions. Uh, our doors are always open and again, uh, we really admire and we are so thankful for uh, for for listening to us and watching us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. It was beautiful to hear about your specific and unique approach that not many surgeons do come across. And uh, it was lovely for us to hear the other flip side as well to just hear how you're able to put yourself into the patient's shoes and uh, make them feel comfortable. Because once again, I'd like to reiterate that point that that is the most important uh, aspect as a patient. So it was truly very beautiful to hear everything you have to say. And once again, it was my privilege to be interviewing you today and hearing about how humble of a person you are. So thank you so much. And thank you to all the Sakshi TV viewers. I'm your host, Sanjana Chekuri. Thank you.